Did you lose a bet or is this some kind of protest? What, being on this show? No, why are you gonna cut your fucking hair, you hippie? <laughs> I don't know, I wanna be like Tim Burton. That's what we're talking about today on this very special episode, not of Review. This is the introduction of a new offshoot of Review. It's a, it's a spin-off, as they say in the television business. Mm -hmm. uh, it is called Revisit. Yes. Uh, but By the way, can we, can we say the word, can we call the movie Mars Attacks? Can we say that word? Attacks. Attacks. Is that too aggressive for you too? It's too aggressive, and it's going to get age restricted. Are we going to get age restricted and demonetized and deplatformed? Sent to the corner sent, table canceled. at the wedding reception with all the weirdos that no one wants to talk to. Right. That's that's strung up in the town square, Jay. All for for talking about this Tim Burton classic. Yes. Uh, Jay proposed talking about Mars Attacks, and I said uh, Mars Attacks. I saw that once in the theater and then once on home video, just to make sure that something wasn't wrong with me that day. And, and, and so that's why we call this Revisit. There's um, other movies we've done on Review that would have fit this mold. That's true. But, uh, uh, but generally, we, Review is movies that we love that we would just want to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've done Ghostbusters and movies like that, where we did Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, things we've watched 100,000 times as Tim, kids. The movie Tim Burton did right before this, Ed, Ed Wood. Wood. Yeah. Uh, those are classic review movies, um, but this is Revisit, where we... Uh, this is more in the camp with, like, Event Horizon or Garbage Pail Kids. <laughs> exactly. We, take, we go back, take a look at something that we haven't seen in a long time, watch it at where we are in life now, and see... Uh, how we feel about it uh, decades later. It's the perfect movie for this, too, because, yeah, I had a similar... On this episode of Revisit, no one cares what you're saying. People just want you to get a f***ing haircut! <laughs> oh my god, what has happened to you? I'm Punda Baba. <laughs> I'm locked in a system. <laughs> I've got the death sentence in 12 systems. And my friend Punda Baba. <laughs> okay, mister, I just want to get a drink. <laughs> Anyways, we're here today to talk about Mars Attacks because you asked me about it. Yeah, well, it was one of those, and maybe other people can relate to this. It's one of those movies that, like you, I saw it in the theater. And I think I saw it maybe once after that on cable or on home video or something back way back when, when it first kind of was, you know, new. And I always had it in my mind like, oh yeah, Mars Attacks, I like that movie. But I hadn't revisited it since then. And my memories of it, uh, even after not having seen it for so long, were so vivid. Like the aliens are, everybody knows the aliens, they're so visually distinct. And the ack, ack, and they make that noise constantly. And I remembered so many great gags. Uh, I don't know if a year goes by that I don't think about the part where the Washington Monument, where the, the Martians are trying to knock it over on a bunch of Boy Scouts. Mm. Like, I'm constantly thinking of that. There's so many things that are still so distinct in my mind from that movie. Yeah. And it kind of scratched a bit of that gremlins itch. Little creatures running amok and having fun doing it. Right. So that's what I remembered. And now, having revisited the movie, I realize why those things are so vivid is because the movie has absolutely nothing else going on in it. It's completely devoid of plot, and uh, it's the second half especially is just a series of gags. And nothing else, and nothing, not to, nothing to hold it together. Yeah, it's a, it's a spectacular disaster. <laughs> And Tim it, Burton's first uh, box office flop. Yeah. It was first. a big old flop, because before that, yeah, obviously, you know, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Beetlejuice, Batman, just like one hit Ooh, after the Edward other. Edward Scissorhands was before this or yeah, after? Yeah, after before, before this, yeah. Now, other than Edward, which was based on a person, was this this first foray into, because Pee Wee was original, Edward Scissorhands, an original script, and Beetlejuice. Uh, well, there's Batman, too. Oh, Batman, yeah. Okay, I guess Batman technically would be the first foray into recognizable IPs, although this is not 
entirely recognizable. Only only people of a certain age would remember the Topps trading cards. Yeah. From the '60s. Is that when they were from? Yeah. Yeah. Well before our time, but. Yeah, it, Tim Burton was fond of them probably, and and this came out in the '90s, so that's only 30 years, which isn't a huge space of time. But if the Topps trading cards were in the '60s, you'd have to be over 30 into your 40s in order to kind of have fond memories of the trading cards. No one really knew that. Yeah, it's a sort of a jumping off point for it the is, movie. It is, yeah, like, and clearly he liked those, I would assume, and I guess. was inspired by them. I don't know. Because it's such a weird thing to make. And, well, it's and, a weird movie for him to want to do, too. Like, you think of all the other, like, this feels so much more like a Joe Dante movie than it does... A Tim Burton movie. When I think of Tim Burton, I think of like gothic, long, oh, yeah. scraggly hair, uh, it, it Nightmare Before felt, Christmas. And this yeah. feels so much more like Joe Dante loves old B movie, yeah. sci fi movies. Yeah, yeah. Don't run. We are your friends. It felt like Tim Burton was hired to make this because it felt like there were certain Tim Burton y things that kind of got shoehorned in there. Mm -hmm. Like the uh, Lisa Marie, like. Uh, alien, the this, obvious this alien in disguise. <laughs> alien. Yeah, and then um, there's just a one part where the Danny Elfman score kind of comes up, and it's like dun, 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 dun. and it's when the uh, aliens are kind of getting prepared to attack, mm. and they're going through like uh, Tim Burton loves his uh, factories, yes, and his like um, methodical mm -hmm. like that sort of thing, um, assembly line, whatever you want to call it. And so there's that scene where like the guns are coming down off the thing and they're getting psh, they're getting their spacesuits put on and that, that <laughs> it's feels just like, a press, like yeah. Tim Burton kind of like style. Um, but yeah, you're right. Not horror, not gothic-y looking, not uh, weird abstract checkered pattern angles yeah. and bent trees and all the, that. This was the start of his downfall, because after this... The start of his downfall. Well, I mean, look at everything after this is mostly, almost completely... I suppose, Almost yeah. completely all shit. Almost completely devoid of what you associate with his style. His new movies have a style, but it's like the ugliest stuff you've ever seen. Yeah. And they're all based on existing IPs. I think yeah. almost everything, except for Corpse Bride, I think was completely his idea. But yeah, this was like the, the, the start of the turn to what Tim Burton has kind of been known for much longer than his early work, which is what everybody still likes and kind of celebrates. Snow Quentin Tarantino. No, one hit after the other, no. All, all his original scripts, all yeah. his original ideas, of course very stylized uh, to his own personal touch, but mm -hmm. Tim Burton, yeah. Because this was 96, it was the same year Independence Day came out. It, it, I believe it actually got pushed back. The release got pushed back because it's similar to Independence Day. Yeah. So like, uh, we gotta put some room between these two movies. I don't think anyone was expecting Independence Day to be as big of a hit as it was. Right. But yeah, big casts uh, going all over the country, seeing different yes. groups of characters. Uh, this almost feels like it could be a parody of Independence Day, but it couldn't have been because it would have been in production at the same time. They came in peace. But it has the uh, the uh, estranged father, mm -hmm. the, the staple of <laughs> the Roland Emmerich movies. The uh, it has a trope that I hate: the the Kansans. One minute fifty-seven seconds. <laughs> did I tell you one or two minutes? You did. Uh, you did. <laughs> all sound like deep South rednecks. Right. Whenever they want to portray poor people in trailer parks uh, in Hollywood. They always have a southern accent. Did something happen to you, Russ? Oh, yeah. Seems years back, our boy here was kidnapped by aliens, did all kind of experiments on him and such. Tell him about it, Russ. I'm not, I'm not a southern redneck, but I find that highly offensive and stereotypical. Even when Kim Basinger's played Eminem's mom in Eight Mile. They lived in a trailer in <laughs> fucking Detroit. She yeah. Went, hey, Eminem, I'm poor. Who's gonna want me? Where are we gonna live? We don't have any money. You live in Detroit. <laughs> these are these are out of touch Hollywood filmmakers. Tell me about it. 
Midwestern people sound different than Southerner people. What are you doing with your life that's so great? We gotta do this or people won't get it. People won't understand that they're poor this and is, stupid. This is Hollywood, baby. I'll tell you one thing, any of the Marshals come around here, I'm gonna kick their butts. <laughs> Anyways, uh, but okay, so well, uh, well, since we're on accents and people, let's talk about the cast. Uh, huge cast, great cast. Huge cast. There's so many I couldn't remember. Oh, okay. Here we go, everybody. Strap in. Ready to watch the talent get wasted before your very eyes. <laughs> we have Jack Nicholson, who plays two roles, and he plays two roles terribly. <laughs> He's okay as the president, uh, like he's fine. It's generic Jack Nicholson performance. The Why second him? role is so baffling because he's clearly supposed to be a comedic character. He's like a like a real estate mogul in Vegas. He's building a casino, so, yeah. but they don't Huckster give him times. a single funny thing to do. No, just and he's his bad at presence it. alone is supposed to be funny, I guess. Even in a time of so-called intergalactic emergency, the people. Still want to roll and boom. It's like look at Jack Nicholson wearing a wacky costume and yeah. doing a voice. Yeah. But he's also terrible as the president. I think he's fine as the president. I want the people to know that they still have two out of three branches of the government working for them, and that ain't bad. But but it's like it's like uh, why have Jack Nicholson be the president? You know what I mean? Like why not just get anybody? Like, uh, it's such a dry cause role. Because they, they, they liked working together on Batman so much. That's half this cast. It's like you, uh, Danny DeVito shows up for two seconds for no reason. Yeah. You want to conquer the world? You're going to need lawyers, right? And that uh, gets vaporized. I didn't read the, uh, the any of the trivia or anything, but I have a feeling Jack Nicholson said, I'll do your movie, but I don't want to just be the boring president. Maybe. I want to have a crazy role. I mean, it could be that, because why the fuck? Other than a, like a talking point, like Jack Nicholson plays two roles. Well, like, they, they sort of the end, they go to like the war room and it's very Dr. Strangelove like. Yes. We have to strike now, sir. Annihilate. Kill. 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 Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Mr. President, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair must, but I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed. Tops. Uh, depending on the breaks. And that's, that movie had Peter Sellers in multiple roles, so I think it might be an homage to that. Then why didn't you get George C. Scott to play the <laughs> general and not Rod Steiger? <laughs> I guess George C. Scott was like pushing, uh, pushing retirement at that. 96? Yeah, he's still around, but uh, he yeah. He died like in like late 90s or early, yeah, maybe 99? Something like 2000 that. 2000 he died? I don't know when he stopped acting, but he read the script. <laughs> he read the script, that's it. Uh, and the Glenn, script was just a series of like post-it notes of scene ideas that were never fleshed out. What? <laughs> I would like for every limo to be stocked with every kind of alcohol known to man. And top it off with a bottle of dome on ice. Shut your mouth! Uh, Glenn Close. Wasted. Wait, Annette Bening. Wasted. Well, you can just, that goes after everybody. Oh, okay. Except for Natalie Portman. Uh, Pierce Brosnan, Danny DeVito, Martin Short, Michael J. Fox, uh, Rod Steiger, uh, Tom Jones, the musical performer. As himself. As himself. Lucas Haas. Whatever happened to him? Uh, he still acts. He was a part of the, the Leo crowd, right? Oh, was he in Wasn't Leo's he a part entourage? Of the, yeah. The, the P word posse. Oh, Leo canceled. Leo's become something else. And I don't want to talk about that. Okay. Speaking of Jack Nicholson, when you you look like Jack Nicholson now uh, and, yes. you're, and you're dating high schoolers. Yes. Uh, yeah, that is, it used to be cute. Like Leo's dating a girl that is five years younger than Leo's dating a girl that is 10 years younger. Yeah. Leo's dating a girl that is old enough to be his granddaughter. <laughs> They don't have any conversations. Leo's 68 and he's dating an 18 year old. Isn't that cute? <laughs> uh, Natalie Portman, uh, Jim Brown, 
Yeah. We got two black exploitation actors, Jim Brown yeah. and Pam Greer. The it's closest good, we have to any like kind of real characters in the movie, relatable characters. Yeah, they have a little arc there. Lisa Marie, um, AKA Vampira. Uh, Jack Black, early role. And uh, uh, Christina Applegate is- I don't even think she has a line of dialogue. No, she does. She says goodbye to uh, Jack Black as he leaves, but you'd never even see her face really. It's no, just, it's so weird. It's a very, unless she got cut from That's the only thing stuff. I can think of is maybe she had a little, cause that's like, you cast an extra for that part. Yeah. With what it is in yeah, the final like, movie. Right, like a small actor who just doesn't have any name to, to mm -hmm. them. But unless he just really wanted that big po like poster with all these names. It, it almost feels like if it was done better, it could be, that could be like some sort of subversive joke. You have this giant cast, all these big name stars, and the first 40 minutes of the movie is a lead up to that final uh, first contact with mm. the Martians. And then just immediately the Martians start vaporizing everybody. And half your cast is, is killed immediately. I think that's what they were trying to do with Jack Black. Like obviously he wasn't a star at the time, right. but his character is like, oh, I'm going off to, to join the military. He leaves his family and then the aliens start attacking. And that's like his big moment to be a hero. And he runs across the, yeah. the field and just immediately gets vaporized. Like, I think in concept, that's supposed to be a joke. None of the jokes are executed well. No. But I, I think that was also like the impetus for Lucas Haas' character to go out and, you know, he was like the, uh, the, the son that they didn't like that much. The yeah. two redneck parents were like, and he was just like the loser that worked at a donut shop. And the son was like the military son that they respected. And he's the one who ends up ironically saving the world, uh, had been the grandma, mm -hmm. the underdogs uh, that nobody liked or respected, the senile grandma and the, the slacker donut shop employee are ironically the ones that saved the planet Earth. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. But they disappear from most of the movie. But they're not really <laughs> central. And then at the end, it's like Natalie Portman and Lucas Haas have a little like cute thing going on. Yeah, that comes out of nowhere. And that, like, I. I I was watching this and I was like, does he like end up in Washington and they, him and Natalie Portman run around and have a little meet cute and nope. like have an adventure together. And, and no, but you kind of get the idea that that happened when it, it's like the first time they ever met yeah. on the steps of the Capitol, the destroyed Capitol. And her character too, it feels like the way it's set up initially, she's the president's daughter. She's kind of not, she's not, pay, the, her parents don't pay much attention to her. Her bedroom has like black drapes around the bed. I think they're going for like a Winona Ryder and Beetlejuice kind of thing. That's what it's missing is like that, the Winona Ryder character from Beetlejuice. She's like the glue that holds that whole movie together. Right. Everything ties back to her. It's just characters all over the place mm -hmm. and uh, no, no central one to focus on other than Jack Nicholson who looks like bored playing the president. Paul Winfield's there. I didn't mention Paul Winfield, uh, and I wanted to, because this is the second time in movie history that he's been vaporized. And you know, it, I bet the effects on that. I haven't watched it in a while, but I bet his vaporization in Star Trek looks better. Than yeah, it people does. getting vaporized in this. It does. <laughs> and we'll put them side by side here, and uh, that's. That's what I want to talk mainly about today is the Paul Winfield vaporization challenge. Can you find a third or fourth or even fifth film in which Paul Winfield has been vaporized? He has an extensive uh, movie history. He has passed on, so we can't ask him, but one could look through all of his movies and watch every movie he's been in, hoping even if it's like a like a period piece or a romantic comedy, <laughs> just hoping. <laughs> Coincidentally, he may get vaporized. You never know. Leave your comments below. I'll accept getting sucked into an airplane engine too. Does that happen to him in something? No. Oh. But it's like the only way you could really get like almost vaporized, I yeah. guess. Uh, like on Earth, other than you could get electrocuted. You, you could get burnt up, you could get set on fire, but really like in, in order, like instantly, like, like demolecularize a human. Yeah. It, it, there's very few ways that that could happen mm -hmm. on earth. Maybe falling into a volcano, uh, getting a spontaneous human combustion, getting sucked into an airplane engine, 
So if any of these things has happened to Paul Winfield at a movie. We'll accept it. We'll accept those. And we don't count uh, his cremation after he died. Presumed cremation, I don't know. He might have been buried. But, um, oh, during that scene, when Jack Nicholson and Glenn Close and others are watching the carnage unfold on TV, mm -hmm. there's a wide shot, Natalie Portman sitting on the ground and she's laughing. Oh. I think someone off camera was like, laugh, like making a joke, funny faces at her. It's like and, an outtake that ended up in the movie because yeah, no one laughing, cared. laughing and then they, they, she stands up and she's very concerned, obviously, the movie isn't like silly in that regard where the characters are laughing yeah. at thousands of people are getting killed mm -hmm. and she's on the ground and she's like giggling. So a uh, very large cast of, of veteran and quality actors, up and coming actors. Michael J. Fox's last big movie before uh, he started, he was on T at that TV show Spin City after this, but this was his last big movie. Other than voice work, he did those Stuart Little movies. Before slowing down because of Parkinson's? Before, yeah, kind of getting, stepping back from acting. Oh, yeah, I suppose. He did this, and I think the Peter Jackson movie, The Frighteners, was the same year. What a role to go out on. That's another one where it's like, there could be an interesting dynamic between him and his girlfriend, Sarah Jessica Parker. He's like straight-laced news reporter guy, and she does like corny tabloid stuff. Uh, puff fashion. pieces, fashion, yeah. Fashion um, so you have those two are not both parts of the media, but they're at odds. What happens with she that? Gets, she gets the bigger stories, ha, ha, ha. Yeah. He and then he just gets G vaporized immediately. Yeah. He works for GNN. And then the Martians, uh, even though they're just murdering everybody indiscriminately, they take her aboard their ship and graft her head onto a dog for some reason. Well, there's the interview with Pierce Brosnan, the White House scientist, mm -hmm. and they're flirting. Yeah. And then uh, Michael J. Fox is uh, jealous of their flirting. And then Michael J. Fox gets vaporized, and then they pick Pierce Brosnan and Sarah Jessica Parker to do experiments on. Were you flirting with me on the show? I just want you to know that I liked it. <laughs> you did. And you're supposed to go, isn't that funny? Because look at the predicament they're in and they're still flirting. I was more thinking, what is the purpose of these experiments? That doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, and then- Aliens do experiments. The, the, this, the point was, was that you take these two characters that were flirting before, and now they're still flirting, even though he's a head in a jar and she has a dog body. And that's the joke? I guess. I mean, a lot of the movie seems to be, yeah, pointing and out all these the characters. Joke. All these characters are, are vapid and stupid, and it's almost like we deserve what we get. That's kind of the tone of the movie. Yeah. It's like the anti-Independence Day, which is a movie that everybody likes because it's so, like, rah-rah and, and earnest with its, uh, right. its, its dumb sentimentality. We will not go quietly into the night. We will not vanish without a fight. We're going to live on. We're going to survive. I blew up Congress. <laughs> Yeah, there, it's not cynical. Uh, see, you could very, like, um, there were a, a, a few hints of that in, in the dialogue, because Jack Nicholson, he's the president, and he's like, well, how, how can I make this look good for me? You know, and, and you could really take an alien invasion and like, oh, well, this, they chose to invade like two months before an election, the election yeah, season. Yeah, give it gotta, an angle. We've got to like, like, um, we got to workshop this. We got to uh, market test this. We, you know, we need to. How, how should I stand with the aliens? Should I wear this color? Will this make me look? You know, and like, how do we how do we use this? Because everything, every issue in society, American society, is politicized. Yeah. And then they say, well, even if it's like a tragic event or this or that, they say, well, how can we use this to make our political party, left or right, look good? Or how can we make them look bad? Mm -hmm. And that, then so you could really make a uh, interesting cynical movie about an alien invasion. Yeah, that would be kind of a fun movie, and it would have to be smartly written. And there's little hints of that early on, but then it kind of goes away. It's it's very surface level, and like I guess that's kind of what they're going for with the first lady. She's obsessed with all like the 
the historical artifacts the around decor, the White House. Yeah, yes. and, and then she, ultimately she dies when the Nancy Reagan chandelier falls on her. The Nancy Reagan chandelier. Yeah. And she's like gasping that it's the Nancy Reagan chandelier. Oh no, but it's about to fall on her head. Yeah. So she gets her comeuppance. I guess. She's not fleshed out enough to care one way or the other. But then, yeah, you have the Rod Steiger character, and he's the, the war, war. Annihilate! Kill! Kill! Then you have the general played by Paul Winfield, and he's a little more peaceful. And he's got that, he, 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 uh, Jack Nicholson chooses him to be the one that the aliens say hello to. Yeah. Because the Rod Steiger's just like, no come, no come! <laughs> um, and then he's like, He's talking to his wife on the giant army phone. But didn't I always tell you, honey, if I just stayed in place and I never spoke up, good things are bound to happen. He's spineless and, and I was like, so what's the approach of the president, Jack Nicholson? What's his approach? Well, he's, he, he's, he actually plays it very well as a president should. Sure. Like, well, okay, they're landing, let's try diplomacy first, you know? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, uh, well, that didn't work because the hippie let a bird go and maybe it spooked him. And then the aliens are just playing us all for suckers. Yeah. It takes two times before we finally learn. Mm -hmm. And the second time is like, okay, well, we have the translator and it says the aliens apologize. It was a misunderstanding. They want to come before Congress <laughs> and give a speech. It, it just lands so awkwardly, and it's so edited so badly. Everything's edited <laughs> poorly. Uh, yeah, I guess so. It's just it, it's like a I don't know, like a college student edited it. Well, it just feels like it feels like a rough assembly. Yeah, like they it feels like they cut out every other scene that actually fleshes things out, and then what's left in is just very like loose. There's there's one part that like really stuck out to me was like. It's your favorite scene when they're tipping the Washington Monument to fall on uh, Boy Scouts. Right. And so something's going on in the White House. I can't remember what it was. And then they just like hard cut to the, the, a group of the Boy Scouts and the Boy Scout leader and they, they were, they're walking towards the monument. And then they cut back to what's going on in there. Mm. And it's like, and then a minute later, then they cut to that scene. And it's like, well, we didn't want the scene with the Washington Monument to just come out of nowhere. Yeah. So we've got to set it up. Well, we don't really have a setup other than just one shot of them walk. We'll just put it in a minute earlier. I guess the idea and is that just, maybe that's just supposed to be like an establishing shot of the city or something. I don't know. Even it, though we've already seen it's not. It's little, very specific. Yeah. It's very it's it's not just like it's not a big like sweeping shot where you see the Boy Scouts and, the, and then the, the camera pans over to the White House. It's just like a shot of them. Mm -hmm. And it's just like they just grabbed it and put it over there. But it's just like dry, like dead ends of takes that just like, like no energy. Yeah. It didn't have... That, I think that's why a lot of scenes that should be funnier than they are don't work is, yeah, everything just falls flat. Like there's a scene conceptually I like early on when they're they're trying to translate it's it's the president and Pierce Brosnan and they're all in that room listening back to a recording and they have I guess our translator is translating the Martian language. Yeah. And it's just like gibberish. All green of skin. Eight hundred centuries ago. Their bodily fluids include the birth of half breeds. But everyone's like listening listening yeah, yeah. intently and they're like trying to make sense of it even though it's clearly just gibberish that doesn't translate. What the hell does that mean? Conceptually that's funny, mm -hmm. but it all just like plays so flat. Uh, maybe didn't care about those those boring scenes. I don't know. That's where that that's those are the scenes that have the best opportunity for humor and satire though. Right. But he didn't seem to care about anything. I will say, I was very impressed on rewatch with all the actual like alien invasion sequences. Yeah. I noticed he shot the movie in scope. It's like two three nine aspect ratio, which Tim Burton doesn't usually shoot in. So when you have like those wide shots of like Las Vegas and the the flying saucers are in the sky shooting down lasers and everyone's running, like it really does capture that feel of like the original War of the Worlds or like an early right. Godzilla movie. They destroy a hotel in it. Mm. I thought that was like uh, uh, like an uh, this sounds like an oxymoron, but a, a big miniature, mm. like uh, the Back to the Future Three train, where it's it's not a full size train, but it's over it's big for a miniature. Yeah. 
So I thought that was that, and they were destroying it. I was like, oh, that's an impressive miniature. But then I read that they just filmed an actual demolition yes. of, a, of an old hotel, casino. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I know about that. Yeah. When the movie came out, oh, okay. that's the Landmark Hotel. That's the famous hotel that was owned by Howard Hughes. Oh, okay. So um, where he lived at the top? He lived at the top. He bought it. Um, it was kind of like a failed uh, a failure its whole existence. <laughs> It was like, uh, what what kind of style was it? It was like future futurism. Mm. Like, it was designed by the guy who designed the Space Needle. Ah, okay. And so, yeah, while they were, I think that was demoed in '95, and it, uh, and around that time was when they were building the Stratosphere. Mm. So you could, there's photos of that with the Stratosphere in construction in the background, which is like. 10 times as tall as it. <laughs> but yeah, they um, they demoed that and then Tim Burton went out with a whole bunch of cameras and filmed it and then matted in people in the foreground running I around. guess that's the quality that makes it look artificial is yeah, the people in the foreground. Yeah. Like all that stuff really works. So I, I guess that's the stuff he was interested in and just had to put up with the boring human characters, I don't know. Well, there was, there was a moment, too, where I thought, while this movie would play really well in black and white, mm. almost like The Mist, because there are scenes where, uh, I think primarily in the White House, and there's very clear backdrops outside. It's a set, mm. and there's like flat, one-dimensional backdrops that are <laughs> so obvious, where it almost looks like it's intentional. Yeah, there's a part like that near the end, too, when Jim Brown finally gets home to his family. Yeah. You think he's dead, but then he shows up, and we're seeing the apartment building has one wall just completely gone. And so we're seeing all these little apartments, but, like, realistically, the layout doesn't make any no, sense. No, it doesn't. Yeah, it's a joke. It's Yeah, it's like a Tim burton kind of stylized yeah. thing. But the sets with the backdrops out the window, and I'm just like, black and white this, mm -hmm. and then it would look like a 1950s movie. yeah. And then definitely the, you know, that's a War of the Worlds reference, the uh, Washington Monument, because they either shoot that down or knock it over. And then the Pam Greer stuff, she's in, like, she has a house in D.C., mm -hmm. and you see outside of her window, and it's real. Yeah. And then we have Jim Brown, and he's in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And instead of working at uh, the, the fictional casino, but he's working at the Luxor, mm -hmm. and he's wearing like a pharaoh costume, and he's he's a he's an ex boxer, so he's hired there as a celebrity to like greet people. All the waitresses are dressed like Cleopatra. Yeah, Tim Burton probably liked that because they got the goofy costumes on, and it's funny. Yeah. Um, but then there's a shot where he's he's because they're not estranged, they're separated or divorced. He, or, yeah, somehow he ended up in Vegas because he's just trying to raise money for his family. He's, he's so. working to pay for his family. Yeah. It's like uh, Alan With his situation. little bit of celebrity that he has. Yeah, but they, they find a spot where he can make a phone call from his apartment because mm. all you see is like, like a brick wall and a chair. Mm -hmm. And out the window, you could see the Luxor in the background. And it's real. Yeah, It's not a, bla a backdrop. And so you know they found the perfect location to where you can make a phone call and you could see the pyramid in the background. And that felt like real, like a real movie. Yeah. And then you have the White House stuff with the <laughs> fake, and the New York stuff with the fake backdrops that could very well be a 1950s mm -hmm. cheap set. And so it's like which... One or the other, yeah. Which way are we going here in terms of production design, mm -hmm. set design? So yeah, I, and I'm, I'm wondering if he's going for that, like that flat campy 50s look and he and especially the the soldiers look out of place because this is modern day yeah and the soldiers are wearing world war ii era costumes with the, the helmets and the you know the tanks are outdated which obviously that would have been an intentional choice but it doesn't stand out as being like an intentional stylized thing right it the way be, it should yes, yes i mean it's possible he wanted to shoot it in black and white i know he had a lot of trouble getting ed wood approved to be shot in black yeah. and white so maybe he was trying to do that with this i don't know but, but that would have gone a long way in yeah and, and it, it conflicts with the full color trading cards yeah because he's not parroting a 50s b movie he's 
aping off those um, those trading cards, which are more serious. They're the horrifying looking. And we had we had our own generation of those trading cards with dinosaur attacks. Do you remember oh, those? Oh wow! Dino dinosaurs attack. I vaguely remember that. I loved those. <laughs> Yeah, I, I it's try, just a series of gruesome images, I'm assuming, right? Of dinosaurs killing people? There, I think there's a, a, like a, a, a very vague story. Okay. Because there was one card where it shows a space station and it shoots down like a time air wave and it says, the experiment begins. Oh. And then there's one dinosaur that says, ripped out of time. And it's like head is being ripped off its skull. <laughs> but, but basically, yes, generally it's just like dinosaurs horribly murdering people. <laughs> I always remember tri Trilobite Terror. They sold these things to children. <laughs> We're showing these cards on the screen. This oh, can we show those cards on the screen? Uh, oh, we have to ask YouTube. We oh, might get oh. demonetized, might get, yeah. platformed, censored, exiled the desert. You have to walk the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. And they send us to the, the land of misfit YouTubers. Yes, yeah. an island where we have to like break up rocks with pickaxes <laughs> in a chain gang. <laughs> oh, because we showed a, an image from dinosaur attacks. I'll have to blur out every card that we show. No, we're showing them. Uh, uh, what? I mean, that makes sense. Like a series of trading cards that is just terrific images of- Oh yeah, I was saying like the, the trading cards are, are kind of spooky. Hmm. The, the aliens look very similar to the Mars Attacks aliens, but they're not as goofy looking. Okay. Um, and they're like, there is a part, there's a part where they, a uh, card where they vaporize a dog. Mm. And it's like, the dog gets vaporized and they show the alien and that happens in the movie. Yeah. So there's, you know, clearly they went through the cards and kind of pulled out the more memorable ones. But they forgot to put it in the context of a story. Yeah. That's but, what this feels like is like a, a series of note cards on the, like the cork board when you're trying to come up with the ideas for what will happen in your movie. They weren't note cards, they were just the trading cards. They just put the trading cards yeah. up on the, on the thing and then that was it. They never fleshed anything else out. They actually unfleshed things out. What the hell does that mean? Yeah, if you could take, cause like, I don't think either of us like Independence Day, but from a basic story structure standpoint, it's pretty solid. It's got everything you need oh, for yeah. a movie like that. So if you were to take like that structure and put it in the context of like the tone of this movie and somehow like meld them together, then you'd probably have something. Yeah, Independence Day is a better film, yeah, I, I'll yeah. say, uh, just from a film perspective. I think I would, I like this more because it's... The, the second half, the first half is a real slog yeah. when it's setting up all these characters, especially when you know that they're not gonna go anywhere or develop anything. Um, but then the second half is almost nothing but Mars Attacks shenanigans. And that's the only uh, fun stuff. Yeah. The, the, I really like, I like the montage. They, the, they're on Easter Island bowling and they knock down, like, like that sort of like playful um, aliens. Cause they're not m like, it's not like they have an invasion plan. You know, they don't want to just the, uh, exterminate the human race. They don't want it. They're just having fun. Yeah. They're, just they're like, gremlins. They're gremlins, yeah. yeah. There's that part when Tom Jones is singing, he's got the backup dancers. The lights go down, they come back up, and it's all the Martians dancing. It's like a gag right out of something you'd see in a gremlins movie. Sure, absolutely. And um, yeah, they're just having fun. Uh, being mischievous and destructive. And like when they, they launch the nuke up there and they s blow up the nuke and suck it into like a balloon. Yeah. I say I like it better than Independence Day because it is, it at least took a stab at being creative. Mm -hmm. It didn't really know which way it wanted to go. Like we said, it could have gone satire, like politics. How does the, how does the earth deal with it, uh, with an alien invasion in a kind of a cynical way, mm -hmm. or just like, my God, these aliens are coming down. What, uh, the, and then instantly we recognize them as being goofy gremlins that are just fucking around. And then we pivot to how do we deal with this? The, we've been invaded by clowns from <laughs> outer space 
that are being goofy, but at the same time, they're extremely dangerous and destructive. Yeah. How, do you, a, how do you deal book. with that? It was made into a movie, too, but it's a book called, like, Martians Go Home. And it was made into a movie, I think Randy Quaid is in it, speaking of Independence Day. But that's similar, where it's like, yeah, all the Martians are just, like, clowns, basically. Hmm. And they have to deal, they're more of an annoyance than anything. Huh. Uh, okay. So that's an angle. Uh, so, yeah, like... Because that is the main joke of the movie is, yeah, the Martians don't want anything. They have no plan. They're just messing with us. Yeah. And it's like, if that's the case, if that's the joke, then you have to beef up the human angle. Yes. The human do, angle do... needs to be competent. But yeah. at the same time, the human angle is incompetent. Mm -hmm. Très bien. I have some good news for you. The Martian ambassador is here, and we've negotiated a settlement. Maurice, get out of the room. Get out now. Yeah, so I like certain certain elements. I hated the, uh, the Pierce Brosnan floating head. That stuff was too goofy. But then you had that that cool robot that, that oh, comes yeah. down and attacks the trailer park for <laughs> no reason at all, uh, and then starts chasing chasing the, the truck. Mm -hmm. Like I always remember that. Yeah, that visual sticks out to me. And speaking of Nightmare Before Christmas, I had read originally the Martians in this were supposed to be stop motion. And that would have gone a long way in, in improving the movie. Yeah. All these Martians, it's not like they kind of go for an, they have kind of a herky jerky yeah. motion. They're trying to do it sort of stop motion looking, but they have that mid 90s CG gloss to them where everything's just kind of like shiny. And I think that was a budgetary that, it would thing. Have, it would have helped, but yeah. the general foundation structure of the movie is just flawed from the get-go yeah or yeah. is it the execution i really don't know I, I think its biggest problem is that it just doesn't have a story there's no story well there's a story aliens invade earth there's yeah, no plot yeah, there's there, no there's no interesting character there's no stuff dramatic arcs there's no there's nowhere for anything to go there's no i mean the stakes are obvious but like there really is no like there's no uh, clock, taking clock, like Independence Day, like you said, solid structure. Yeah. Like, okay, three-act structure. We got our aliens, They, what are they? They're coming, well, first attack happens, then we recover. We flesh out all our human characters. They and, all have something to do related to the plot. Yes, then we realize... They're that, not, uh, at the end of this movie, just Sarah Jessica Parker and just, Pierce Brosnan. Their heads are just rolling around on the floor. Nothing. Nothing. There's no, like, attempt to, like, oh, we have to get... Pierce Brosnan is the only one who knows how to yeah. take down the aliens because he knows all about their shield systems because he studied that, and now they have him up in the spaceship. We, we've got to get Lucas Haas and Natalie Portman and the grandma with space guns and the, the two sons of uh, Pam Greer. Yeah, that's kind of a fun part when they start shooting up the White House with yeah. the alien space guns. They're the only ones. Because they play video games. They, 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 they're, they're, all the young kids avoid the aliens' uh, sensors because they, they're too, their brains aren't, their frontal, frontal lobes haven't reached the age of 25. Yeah. Like Star Trek Picard, season three. <laughs> uh, so the aliens can't detect them aboard their spaceship. So And Grandma's so old, her frontal lobe fell out. <laughs> so bring Grandma, the two kids, Lucas Haas and Natalie Portman. Finally, I get to do something. Mm -hmm. All I do is sit around the White House all day, and my parents ignore me. Well, kid, now you got to save the country. <laughs> I'll make you our first ambassador to space. Good, Dad. Now I have something to do. <laughs> Son, we always thought uh, Randy. We always thought what? What the fuck is his name? Uh, the Lucas Oz character? No, uh, Jack Black. Oh, what? Well, I don't. We know. always thought Jack Black was the, was the hero, but his pants were falling down, and he saw his butt crack, and then he got zapped by aliens because he ran at them like a moron. Mm -hmm. But you, now's your chance to be our new favorite son by proving us that you've got the gusto and the smarts because you fool around on that computery thing. <laughs> right? Let's make him, uh, he, he, he's early into the internet. Sure. So you and your new girlfriend, Natalie Portman, and the two sons of Pam Greer and Jim Brown, uh, who've got the space alien guns, who are very skilled at video games. That was a small arc. 
All you guys go. Isn't that what happened in Independence Day? Jeff Goldblum and uh, the guy who punched the other guy got <laughs> in, a, in, a, in an alien spaceship. He didn't punch him. He slapped him. Oh, slapped him. him, yes. Welcome to Earth. Oh, wow. Jeff Goldblum and the slapper got <laughs> in an alien spacecraft and flew up to the, the mothership to fuck around and do something. Yeah. So, because, because Will Smith is a pilot and Jeff Goldblum is a computer guy, yes, yes. they work together to accomplish a goal. They have to go get uh, Pierce Brosnan's head because Pierce Brosnan is the only one. They have to bring Pierce Brosnan's head back down to Earth. Mm. And then Pierce Brosnan says, oh, you've got my head. Let's go. And then, um, wait a minute. Sarah Jessica Parker and her dog body are still left behind. They're in a different laboratory. Well, well, fuck her, we gotta go. No, we've got to go back for her because I've realized I'm in love with her. And her and uh, Michael J. Fox were having marital problems and maybe he was, he was very, 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 instead of just being jealous, he was verbally abusive towards her career. Mm. You're just a fashion lady. I'm the GNN reporter. That's the tone should, of their relationship. I know, but it been. should be more hostile so yeah. that you don't like him. Sure. So that you get, she has a reason to leave him for Pierce Brosnan who says, you know, you may just do a fashion show, magazine video show on TV, but you actually do have very good instincts and interviewing skills. See, now you're talking about the, the Grandpa Munster plot in Gremlins too. Well, sure. He hosts the horror show, but he wants to be a real- those are movies that work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then they don't just accidentally stumble on how to kill the Martians in the last 10 minutes because the movie needs to end. Yeah. Even like uh, like Jim Brown, yeah, he's a former boxer. So at the end of the movie, we have a scene where he's boxing the aliens. He self-sacrificed himself to distract the aliens so that the plane could take off. Yeah. But that was not a character arc uh, or growth because he was almost like that already because he was self-sacrificing himself by lowering his standards to work in a casino. Yeah, if he'd started as like a selfish, you know. That's the Danny DeVito character that needs to go out and mm. if he didn't die pointlessly. Shit. He's in the movie for like one minute for no reason. But, but uh, a huckster or the or the the uh, alternate Jack Nicholson character. Like yeah. con artist, huckster, someone who's selfish. Now, if Danny DeVito had said, you know, guys, I'm, I just want money, and blah, 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 but yeah, I'm going to go out there and start punching those aliens. I'm going to do my best, and I'm going to die for the cause of you guys escaping oh, yeah. because I have lived a whole life. You have a little speech by him in the back of the plane. You know, I've lived a whole life of being a schmuck. Who's, I've only ever thought of myself. I've only ever thought of myself. And you know what? And they'll say, the plane's overweight once he gets on. <laughs> Or, or uh, fuck it, you get, uh, what's his face in there? Who's the guy who played Nedry? Uh, oh, Wayne Knight. Wayne Knight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally unappreciated in my time. Get Wayne Knight. Sure. Wayne Knight's always eating hot dogs, and, and, and the plane's overweight because of Wayne Knight. <laughs> and uh, he says, you know what? You guys take off without me because I can't even fit on that plane. I'm going to go, and I'm going to throw hot dogs at the aliens. <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? You want food? Because he opens up his coat and he's got like rows of hot dogs. <laughs> and he takes out a hot dog and he goes, ooh. It's like and the, Twinkies and Slim yeah. Jims. Yeah. And, yeah. and the alien goes, <laughs> and then, and then and he, the alien tastes it. <laughs> and, and then he's, oh, I got plenty more. And he starts walking and the aliens are like following him. And yeah. he's like, hot dogs, hot dogs, <laughs> hot dogs. The aliens are eating the hot dogs. And then the plane takes off. And then once he's run out of hot dogs, they look at him. <laughs> and then they do like the the like the the, the 3D scope, oh, like and Looney they, Tunes, like Looney Tunes, and they see his body, and it looks like a juicy like like Thanksgiving turkey. <laughs> and then and then you just see an alien go like this, with its big like weird alien tongue, and then go, <laughs> and, then, and then then they start eating him. So there you have a character arc but that one is puts also an still apple humorous. In his mouth. One puts an apple in his mouth and they rip all his clothes off. Okay. <laughs> oh, and they use like an alien flamethrower and they toast him. So then you have a, way, a naked Wayne Knight with, a, with an apple in his mouth and he's all juicy and delicious. Like a, and they all put bibs on. And yeah, yeah. Like it's, it's, it's go full comedy. Still in the tone of the movie. Still in the tone of the movie. It would work and it would arc his character. But... Like I said, it kind of falls flat. And then he doesn't even need to die. He punched them all to hell. And but how did he get there? He got to DC at the end somehow. 
It seems like he just wanted to film Martian's uh, shenanigans. Because that's basically the entire second half of the movie until they're like, oh, I guess we got to wrap this up. Uh, the music. Slim Whitman music. I'll Makes their heads explode. Which I'd be remiss if I didn't point out. It's just a direct copy of the conclusion to Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Turn on the record flyer! But that's sad. Yeah, they're defeated by bad music and that. It's like the exact same thing. I'm using Attack of the Killer Tomatoes as an example of good story structure in comparison to Mars Attacks. Again, it's sort of like, uh, uh, it, is, it is follow the theme that the, well, the underdogs are the winners in the end. Let's go to Tahoe in the caves. Mm -hmm. And then they go, and that's how, where the movie ends. <laughs> I do like, it is funny when, because Tom Jones plays himself, and they need a pilot, and they happen to run into him. And we better get out of here. You know how to fly a plane? Sure, you got one? And it's like, can you fly a plane? Yeah, sure, why? Just, this happens to be Tom Jones that can fly the plane. Well, the way the movie ends is, is the only actual real funny thing. They, they leave the cave, the, the Martians have been defeated, mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, rebuilding the world, and there's like animals all around, and then... They start playing, you know, it's not unusual. Yeah. And the, they cut the footage of like birds dancing. And, <laughs> and they then, start landing on and, him. And, and Tom then. Jones is there and, and like a, a deer comes up to him and he's petting it. And then it just cuts the credits. <laughs> it just cuts to black. There's no like, like big shot of the world or, you know, any, anything else. It's just Tom Jones uh, petting deer. Yeah. And it just cuts to, from that. <laughs> he's our final character we see in the film. Yeah. Is someone who's been in the movie for like, Four minutes, and it's like, is that a joke? Is, is, I mean, it's it, funny. Is it like it's it like made me laugh, but it made me laugh in a way that's almost outside of the movie. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I don't. I, it feels like a, like a big fuck you to the audience. Like, well, I was thinking about thanks, that too. suckers. Yeah, like, I was thinking about that where like there's the scale of movies that are done just basically as a troll. Yeah. Where you have like on one end of the spectrum, you have Freddy Got Fingered. Yeah. Which is like there. That's a joke on the studio that put up money for it and the audience. And on the other end, you have something like Gremlins 2, which is like the movie's got lots of jokes. It's making fun of sequels. It's making fun of the first movie. But it is still, it still functions as a movie. Yeah. It has a story and it works. And Mars Attacks is like somewhere in the middle on that scale. But I don't think it's intentionally there. No. <laughs> it just kind of is. It's like, uh, like that ending. It's like, we're just done.